Uh, today I want to talk about the spotted lantern fly. It's this weird looking bug. Showed up a couple years ago in like Pennsylvania and uh, New Jersey. And it does nothing. It just sits on the tree. And it like, uh, it can barely fly. It, it has like five different cycles of uh, like growth. They call it an instar, whatever that means. But, um, so I'm looking on the Smithsonian website about this thing because it's such a weird bug. I always see them around on my land and they, they like just, they just sit on plants. They don't move ever. And if they do move, they like try to like fly into me head first and then just fall to the ground. They're like, they're like retarded. They're like they have no purpose. And I'm reading the Smithsonian article and they're, it's complaining about how they're a plague and you should kill them on, on site and how uh, they're plaguing the, the farmers. I haven't seen these things eat one, like even take a bite of anything from any tree, from any, they're, they always sit on weeds too. Anyway, so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this this guy I watch called Jay Dreamers. And he's always going, going he's always uh, talking about the plasma apocalypse. The plasma apocalypse is the cyclical cataclysm that changes all life on Earth. The plasma apocalypse has been known by every culture. It's been recorded in every religion. It's been described from various perspectives and has gone by many names. Armageddon, the end of days, the rapture, the end times, judgment day, the apocalypse. The event has always been seen as being both a destructive and life-giving process. When it brings death to one thing, it gives birth to another. It's a marker for both the end and the beginning of recorded time. Many of our ancient ancestors knew about the cyclical world reset. They would prepare and plan for their survival and the preservation of their families, retreating to deep underground caverns when they saw the signs and omens of destruction. Because the exact date of the event was never known, they made annual preparations which would become traditions that would be carried out by their descendants who would eventually forget about the cataclysm to come. We are those descendants. This generation has no memory of the creation event, the reoccurring genesis of our world. It survives mostly in the collective subconscious of humanity, secretly escaping through creative mediums like books, movies, and music. Those who remember do so in part, as if trying to recall a powerful dream that slips away from the conscious mind. Those who try and return to the old ways are avoided, mocked, and humiliated, labeled doomsday preppers and preachers of doom and gloom, heretics to the divine and all-powerful church of humanity. But the ancients knew a secret. Those who survive the reset will inherit the new world as masters of themselves and their environments, true and complete freedom bequeathed unto them from a dying age. As I said in the beginning, it has been described from various perspectives. The following is an abbreviated account of the events of the plasma apocalypse as given by my own. The electromagnetic polarity of our world will begin to fluctuate before completely reversing, causing the first signs of what's to come. The sky itself will begin to moan like a woman about to give birth. The sun will disappear for a time, and the world will become very dark. During the neutral point of the polarity shift, the world will experience zero gravity. Everything that isn't attached to the Earth or in it will float. The invisible electromagnetic force field around our world will dissipate, and the physical barrier that keeps the Earth pressurized will break as a massive hole appears in the sky above the North Pole, revealing the plasma vortex that leads to other realms. Bloodlines who have kept the secret of the black hole in the sky and who have prepared over many lifetimes for this moment will enter their rockets and blast off, shooting themselves into the swirling vortex to finally make their escape from this world. Ignorant spectators will only assume their governments are fighting off a strange alien invasion. The hole in the sky will cause the world to depressurize, expanding the atmosphere into instant fog and mist, causing a temporary shortage of oxygen and rupturing eardrums and creating a spiraling wind that will grow into a world storm. The downdraft of that world storm will pull supercooled air from the upper atmosphere down around the Arctic Circle, instantly freezing all it touches into frozen statues of ice. Everything that was floating will be sucked up into the storm towards the opening above the North Pole. Bodies of water that are not sucked out through the opening in the sky will freeze into massive chunks of hail as large as boulders waiting to fall back to the ground, and water that isn't frozen will be polluted by the dust and debris of the storm, giving it a blood-like color waiting to rain back down onto this world. The earth will grow in size, causing worldwide earthquakes that will turn much of the soil into mud through liquefaction. With the electromagnetic force field temporarily down, the plasma that spirals around our world will enter into our atmosphere, looking for attractive places to ground itself. The more powerful plasma streams will carve out canyons and tug at the salty, mud-covered ground, creating mountains in short time. Many centers of civilization will sink into the mud, while others will be petrified instantly. Otherworldly creatures and beings that I call phantasoids will enter into our world. World. The influx of plasma will possess some of the living, reanimate the dead, and bring life to electronics, all of which will submit to its objective 
to seek out and remove those with the old frequency signature until the plasma is cut off from its source. Smaller strands of plasma will dock with the heads of the plasma possessed and reboot the brains of many survivors wiping their memory of the past. The plasma streams in various forms will set fire to much of the world. Electromagnetic polarity will reverse and a bluish-white beam of plasma will shoot up from the center of the Earth, up through the North Pole, into the opening in the sky for all to see, also known as Project Bluebeam. The direction of light will reverse, flowing upward, revealing the true nature of our cosmic surroundings. Light will not come from a focal point called the Sun, but from the sky itself and will be various shades of purple, red, orange, and green, depending on one's proximity to the North Pole. The electromagnetic force field will surround our world once again, repelling the rivers of plasma and cutting them off from their source. Our world will be inundated with plasma. A weak electromagnetic force will emerge, allowing leftover floating debris to fall back down to the ground. Meanwhile, objects that cross the upper atmosphere force boundary will fall upward to their barrier above. Steampunk survivors will sift through the piles of junk that fall to the ground, scavengers of old world artifacts, looking for clues to their past, and trying to reverse engineer or repurpose leftover technology. The world will be energized with life by the sudden influx of plasma, which will alchemically create an abundance of oxygen and other elements that will promote extended lifespans. The strong electromagnetic connection between all life forms will promote peace and enable psychic abilities amongst the survivors. Plants, animals, and people, and electronics will be able to communicate with one another because of this. The muscles of many survivors will seem strengthened as the weakened electromagnetic force, once called gravity, lessens the weight of everything. These conditions and less pressure on the surface will allow for gigantic growth of all life born into the new world. When those conditions begin to change, life will shrink in size over time once more. Survivors emerging from the earth will carve images of the apocalypse into the rock as a reminder to future generations who will eventually forget all about these events. Small groups will retain the knowledge. One group will guard the secrets of the eye in the sky, passing it along down their generations to empower their lineage. The other group will share their memories but will not be believed. Because they will be infiltrated by the other group, they will develop tests for outsiders to pass, to prove their intentions selfless, wise, and loving. One group will hide in plain sight, slowly manipulating the amnesia-induced world. The other will go unnoticed, becoming reclusive and waiting for the seekers of truth to find them. Pockets of lower frequency survivors will turn to cannibalism before the world's plant life begins to regrow. Bantazoids will fight for their survival, or hide from the natives of their strange new world, only to become mythic and legendary creatures, the fantastic beasts and monsters of old. Anyway, it goes from blue sky to red sky. So he's, he's always like talking about the blue and red and whatnot. And this bug, it has its life cycle. It starts out, it starts out blue. And then it turns bright red. And then it turns into a flying bug that kind of looks like a curtain. And then when it opens its wings, it's like the curtain opens. So a gold beam and then a red sky from a curtain that opened, that which is its wings. It starts out in blue, like a blue color. Then it goes to a red color, bright red. And then it goes to the flying type. And the thing, like it can't really fly. It can only like guide, like glide itself. And it, it's horrible flying. Like it's, it's actually kind of funny watching them fly. They like fall on the ground. Like they can't, they can't steer. It's like they're drunk. This, I've had these things that they just bounce into me and then just fall on the ground and then don't do anything. They're like, they're, <laughs> they're retarded bugs. They're like drunk bugs. And they're blue and red. And then they have a, a curtain on, out on their wings and it opens up to a red sky with a gold beam in the middle, which is what this plasma apocalypse guy has been talking about. And he's been going, he goes through like every single movie and almost all these movies they talk about, there's so, such hidden meaning in them. Like go watch it. Back to the Future. Back to the Future is one of the most random movies ever. John Mulaney, the comedian, has a great like bit on Back to the Future and how absolutely insane it is. And there weren't special things for kids the way they are now. Like we would just go see movies, any movie, like Back to the Future. That was a movie like everyone could see, kids could kind of see it. Great movie, right? I rewatched it recently. It's a very weird movie. <laughs> Marty McFly is a 17-year-old high school student whose best friend is a disgraced nuclear physicist. <laughs> and I shit you not, they never explain how they became friends. <laughs> they never explain it. There's not, not even in a lazy way, like, hey, remember when we met in the science building? Like, they don't even do that. <laughs> and we were all fine with it. We were just like, what, who's his best friend? A disgraced nuclear physicist. All right, proceed. <laughs> What a strange movie to sell to be a family movie. Two guys had to go in and do that. They had to be like, okay, we got an idea for the next big family action comedy. All right, it's about a guy named Marty 
and he's very lazy. He's always sleeping late. Okay, is he, is he cool like Ferris Bueller? No. But he does have this best friend who's, you know, a disgraced nuclear physicist. I'm confused here. This best friend, this is another student or, oh, no, 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 no. No, this guy's either like 40 or 80. Like, he, even we don't know how old this guy's supposed to be. But one day, the boy and the scientist, they go back in time and they build a time machine. Whoa! Okay, I think I see where you're going here. They build a time machine and they go back in time and they stop the Kennedy assassination. Ah. Oh, wow, that's a really good idea. I mean, we didn't even think of that. All right, well, what do they do with the time machine? Well, now I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. We thought, uh, we thought it would be funny, you know, if the boy, if he went back in time and, you know, he tried to fuck his mom. <laughs> I don't know. We thought that'd be fun for people. But no, no, good point. No, he doesn't get to. He doesn't get to. But because this family friend named Biff, he comes in and he tries to rape the mom in front of the son. The dad's got to beat the rapist off of her. And also, we're going to imply that a white man wrote Johnny B. Good, so we're going to take that away from him. <laughs> well, this is the best movie idea I have ever heard in my life. We're going to make three of them. Now, you say they go to the past. How about we call it Back to the Past? No, no, no. A Back to the Future? Right, but they go to the past. Yeah. What is that movie about? That's freaking nuts. If you ever played Fortnite, they have like these events every once in a while, like every, each season. The recent season was, uh, there's a giant pyramid in the middle of the, the map, the game map. The, the event was a beam of light goes from the pyramid up into the sky, breaks the dome of the game. Like there's literally a dome in the game. The, the dome opens up and creatures and stuff. Why is this being showing up and everything? Yigger cell is a giant tree of light that goes up and, and splits the splits the uh, the world during Ragnarok. There's all kinds of like connections to this. Well, this this guy Jay. Anyway, that's that's his that's his theory kind of. But it's in it's in everything, especially weird movies. It's uh 
it's like the it's subconscious almost it's kind of like the nine the how the pre, people call it pre-programming of 9-11 when i don't think it was pre-programming i think it was just that's a subconscious thing that was happening like a, it was a, it was like a create it was like a uh, the creator kind of like pointing giving hints that it's got, something's happening and I think that's what this plasma apocalypse thing is. And if you don't, and then I get, I get this, I see this bug and I start thinking, hmm, a sign from above, like, what would a sign from above be like? And then I'm seeing this bug and it's like blue, it goes from blue, red to a t- curtain that opens up to a gold sky and, and red, and then a gold beam of light and a red sky. If that isn't a sign and the thing smashes into you and just falls on the ground, if that is not a sign, <laughs> I don't know what the frig is. The, bur- the purpose of the bug is to be a sign. I don't know what it's gonna- it sounds crazy. I get it, but like, I- there's no other purpose for this bug. It's pretty blatant. And the Smithsonian article, I find out that the the the, the uh, plant that the bug likes the most is called Tree of Heaven. Yggdrasil, Tree of Heaven, like it's all connecting. And the, uh, it's, it's, and the tree of heaven is a, uh, it's a weed, I guess. I never heard of it. And, um, the, uh, yeah, the Smithsonian had that art, the article for the Smithsonian, I'll have it up on the screen, all the little weird stuff they say in it. One part, they say the only, the only species that they found that could kill the spotted uh, lanternfly was a fungus that turned them into uh, a zombie. And then zombified the, the spotted lantern fly. It was all kinds of apocalyptical uh, language in the Smith- Smithsonian article. It was pretty, it's really weird. And yeah, so I just I just wanted to uh, bring that up. It's something, shit's getting crazy. Oh, and the, the Smithsonian article said that the end of time, it says, it says something really weird about when the spotted lantern fly is currently as west as like Ohio. And it said, when the spotted lantern flying gets to California, it's the end of times. Something like real blatant like that. I'll have to read it. I'll have to show it on the screen. But it's like, so maybe that's what they know what's going on. And they're speaking encoded language on purpose. And uh, they're saying when it gets to California, something's going to go down. I don't know how long that's going to take. Because the, thing, it's been, the thing's been around since 2015. Apparently, that's what the Smithsonian says, but I haven't seen the thing, the things since like last year. And it said it started in Leesport, Pennsylvania. And I'm in New Jersey, so I'm kind of close. And I, I haven't seen it since like 2020 it was the first time I saw the thing. But they're, uh, they've been showing up a lot more. That's why I noticed. I don't know. But yeah, that's the... Uh, like that would be a way to, to send a sign if you were the creator just look at nature right so as soon as I, it, I'll show the map of where it's at now it's like in Ohio and if it gets to California maybe something crazy is going to happen who knows I don't know I just thought it was interesting I uh, hope you enjoyed the video